We are going to get started. I'm very excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, first, I want to say welcome. My name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I'm a professor at Rutgers Graduate School of Education. And I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions. And we are co-sponsoring this event today with Jobs for the Future. And we are really, really excited to have two amazing uh, speakers with us today who are going to uh, participate in a conversation with me about uh, how you start registered apprenticeships. And so we have with us today, Melissa McGregor, who is uh, director of uh, the um, what's called Improving Diversity and Equity in Apprenticeships in Manufacturing, or um, for short, IDEA-M, at Jobs for the Future, and Ginger Allison, who is director a, a director as well at Jobs for the Future. So our event today is called How to Create a Registered Apprenticeship. And we really want to just kind of break things down for folks. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is National uh, Apprenticeship Week. So Today, we are going to detail the ins and outs of registered apprenticeship and how it can be beneficial to students and administrators at minority serving institutions and other institutions as well, as well as for employers. And we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to hear from Melissa and Ginger, who are practitioners who work at Jobs for the Future, or JFF, and they're going to discuss all the practical tips. They're going to give you access to lots of resources, and they're going to talk about who to get in contact with to set up registered apprenticeships. So um, what we're going to do today is we're going to have um, a few questions between myself and Melissa and um, and Ginger. And then we are going to open it up for questions from all of you. So I want to direct your attention to the Q&A on your screen. Put all your questions in there and we will get to all of them. Oh, we, we hope we have one hour, but we have some really uh, smart panelists today and I'm sure they'll get to everything. So um, first of all, welcome, uh, Melissa and Ginger. Really happy to have you here with us. Really uh, happy Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get started. And Ginger, I'm going to direct the first question toward you. And so can you start by telling everyone just a little bit about the registered apprenticeship model? What is it? Sure. So first, I just want to say that I love the registered apprenticeship model. It's one of my favorite post-secondary pathway options because it is what we call an earn and learn, right? So it is a combination of paid on-the-job training and classroom education. So it is at least 2,000 hours of on-the-job training and 144 hours per year of supplemental education. So it's not an and or situation, it's a both. It is training on the job and education. So that supplemental education could be um, through a degree program, it could be through a high school or a CTE program. It could be offered in-house at an employer. So if, if an employer has their own training program, it can be offered in-house, it can be online, it could be in person, it can be. So when we say classroom education, I always kind of, I like to outline that that doesn't necessarily mean it has to occur in a classroom, but it is the education component with the theoretical and then the on the job training is the practical application of the skills that they're learning in the classroom. And so it is typically um, one to seven years in length. It always leads to an industry recognized credential. Um, a journey worker card is what the, the apprentices will gain at the end of their apprenticeship. If it is aligned with other CTE programs or other training, there of course is the option um, and the opportunity to earn more credentials. So those stackable credentials, if it's an IT program, then there's several different layers of the CompTIA that they can go through and including, you know, the A plus or the C plus plus. And I'm going to say all of these wrong because that's not my area of expertise, but just know that there is the opportunity to earn all those stackable credentials. But in the end, there is the national, um, industry recognized credential that is granted through the Department of Labor. Um, they are apprenticeships while 
um, in the past have been, at least in my mind, have been typically um, towards the skilled traits in um, construction. You you hear about you know electrician or plumber um, apprenticeship programs. Whenever I first was introduced to uh, apprenticeship, the first thing that came to mind was like medieval times and blacksmiths and shoe cobblers and apprenticeship programs then. Um, but that just goes to show you that this is the tried and true um, method for training a works uh, a workforce, upskilling a workforce. And so while it has roots in the skilled trades, it has expanded to other industries now. We're seeing apprenticeships in IT, in communications, in transportations and logistics, energy, banking and finance, advanced manufacturing, and Melissa can probably tell you so much more of what's happening in that realm, um, healthcare, sales and marketing, hospitality, business and management. Um, we have also begun to register some programs in like uh, project management and um, in, uh, I, I, I almost want to say, well, in teacher apprenticeships, because we have such a huge educator shortage now that that is what's um, become really prevalent. So I always like to just say whatever occupation you can think of, there's probably a way that it can be um, developed into an apprenticeship program. All right. Thank you. I, that's, I think it's really exciting. And I wish that more people knew about this because I think it's such a great opportunity to, um, you know, just to be able to get a really well-rounded preparation for what you want to do as you move forward. So, uh, okay, Melissa, um, I have been told that you know everything and anything about setting up registered apprenticeships, so don't let me down. Um, so what makes it unique and beneficial for institutions of higher education, colleges and universities, um, students and employers, especially, and I'd love for you to talk about that within, you know, what, what would be um, beneficial for minority serving institutions as well about, about registered apprenticeship. Sure. And I will just start by saying I share Ginger's passion for registered apprenticeship. Um, I, the first program that I designed and ran, uh, and I managed a program was as a community college sponsor. So this absolutely 100% can be done by community colleges. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways to start an apprenticeship program. Um, and it is a bifurcated system across the United States. There are different there are different ways to um, launch a program in different states. So I would say the the top thing, the number one thing to keep in mind is don't do this by yourself. There's so much help out there. There's so many intermediaries that are available. Jobs for the Future is an intermediary, and we would be more than happy to help you um, launch your apprenticeship program. Um, besides not doing it by yourself, um, you can't actually, uh, do it all by yourself unless like Ginger said, uh, they're doing teacher apprenticeships now. And so then, um, an institution of higher education would be the employer, the employer of record. So, um, you have to have employers, um, and a, an apprenticeship program begins by, a company, an employer hiring a person as an apprentice. So it's a job. It's a real full-time job. And that's what makes it a really exciting opportunity for your students is that it starts out as a job. It's not education first, and then they go and get their job. It's this combined um, tool that you can use to train and educate a person at the exact same time. They go to school, they go to work. They learn something in school. They have the opportunity to put that into practice on the job. And so this that makes um, employers the really critical partner in all of this. Um, so I would say step number one is, are employers in your local area telling you that they would like to hire apprentices? And if they are, then it's a definite yes, a perfect opportunity for you to start an apprenticeship program. If you don't have any employers in your area right now saying, hey, we'd like to start an apprenticeship program, or can you tell us more? Can you be a partner in apprenticeships? Then it's um, it's not a good time to do that, but it's a good time to start launching those conversations in your um, outreach to employers. So when you're in the community, in the business community, talking with employer partners, um, 
mention apprenticeship and ask if that's a, a training model that, that they would like to use. And um, then we can help you get launched. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So going back to Ginger, uh, so how can registered apprenticeship support underserved students, especially those from first generation, low income backgrounds? I was one of these students um, or students who are maybe returning to college at an older age. Really curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So registered apprenticeship is really a great solution um, for all those populations because the, the model itself, you know, because it is an earn and learn. Um, apprentices are full-time um, benefits receiving employees. And so um, the apprentices can, they're earning a wage while they are learning a skill. And so they can continue to contribute to the to the family household expenses, um, apprentices who have families of their own. I mean, there's that opportunity cost, right, of going to school or working to, you know, support my family. So this kind of removes that opportunity cost. They they have the opportunity then to earn the skill, earn their post secondary credential while they are being paid to do so. So it can offset some of the costs for their college degrees. Um, there are, for registered apprenticeship programs, because it is federal, there are resources available through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, or what I like to say, I just say your, your local workforce board. Um, they have um, business um, services folks and um, youth program folks and um, on the job training folks that can help for um, any of those apprentices that are eligible to receive those benefits. They can provide those wraparound supports. They can also help to offset the um, wage cost for a limited amount of time um, with the employer. So they it, it kind of lifts some of that um, from the employed, some of that you know responsibility from the employer as well, and helps to support. So. Beyond that, they will have also gained a competitive advantage because not only will they have learned a post-secondary credential, but they will have um, earned the experience that um, most employers require. So if you finish your college degree and you go to apply for a job, what you're going to find is that the qualifications are going to be the college degree and a certain amount of experience. And so apprentices um, have taken care of both. You know, most of the time though, they're going to stay with the organization where they held their apprenticeship because it also helps them to um, create that, that loyalty with that program. So the retention is 93% of apprentices who complete their program, 93% of those stay with their employer. So the, it, it really does provide that stability from all different directions. Um, and then also they have an ability to earn higher wages. So apprenticeships are pathways to high wage quality jobs. The average completion um, salary for an apprentice is uh, around $77,000 a year. Um, and then the, um, the apprentices, uh, research has found that apprentices um, earn around 200 to 300,000 more than their peers over the entirety of their careers. So it really does give them um, that competitive advantage and it really pushes them out um, in front of the pack, right? So it really gives all of those populations the opportunity, it kind of removes barriers. It gives them the opportunity to um, build these pathways into these high wage careers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I like that, uh, especially as I said, you know, coming from the background that I do, it's just um, so important to think about all the different opportunities here. So, um, okay, so Melissa, um, I want to ask you to talk to me as if I don't know anything about registered apprenticeship, okay? Um, and I know nothing in comparison to you and Ginger. So, um, so if I'm if I'm a college or university, and in particular because we, you know, we reach out to minority serving institutions. So, um, if if a, an MSI or any other college or university wants to design a registered apprenticeship program, tell me what are the first steps 
And, you know, how do you begin the program? Just kind of take me through step by step, because I, I feel like there's so much opportunity within the MSI community to create registered apprenticeships that could be life changing for not only students and but for communities, for families, et cetera. So take me through as if I know nothing. <laughs> well, Mary Beth, um, it is a, it is life changing for people to um, get into an apprenticeship program. Um, I've I've seen it happen in in so many people's lives, and um, it's it's an incredible game changer um, because you are earning money while you're earning this, the, you're learning the skills for your occupation. Um, so if, if an MSI or any institution of higher education wants to get started again, um, uh, don't do it by yourself. The, the whole idea of apprenticeships revolves around partnerships. Um, so your partnerships are going to be critical. Um, you should have employer partners, number one, who are interested in hiring for a particular occupation. Um, if you have uh, multiple, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back and say, um, one of, one of the things about a, a registered apprenticeship program is that you register the program with the department of labor. So, um, a lot of people say registered apprenticeship and, um, and, uh, you might, ask who do I who do I register with and it's the Department of Labor so every state has um, a state Department of Labor office um, some states are uh, have a, a state apprenticeship agency and some do not they're just um, they just fall under sort of the federal um, Department of Labor and um, you can you can look them up who you can look up who your who your state um apprenticeship agency is on the Department of Labor website on apprenticeship.gov and um, discover, you know, who to call. Um, it's a really good idea to, to figure that out um, in some of the beginning conversations to understand whether you're going to be going through a state apprenticeship agency or through the federal system. Um, and so that's, that's a step that you would take when you're about to register your program. Um, before that, you're going to need, um, so whoever registers the program, <laughs> backing up again, uh, whoever registers the program is the program sponsor. So you will be sponsoring the registered apprenticeship program. And that comes with um, all of the power and all of the responsibility. You will have the responsibility of managing the program, of registering the apprentices in the RAPIDS database or in the state database. Um, you will have um, the responsibility of ensuring that any, um, if you're if you're an MSI, you're a group sponsor and group means that uh, you're serving multiple employers. There's only individual and group when you're registering a program. So you can register as an individual uh, apprenticeship program, which means pretty much you're a company who's going to hire your own apprentices or a group sponsorship. And the group means multiple employers will participate in this program. So um, you would um, you would need to have employers. The... Um, in the very beginning, Ginger explained that there's this com combination, right, of the education piece and then opportunities to put that into practice on the job, the on the job piece. So we call those related technical instruction. And now I'm going to use an acronym, RTI. <laughs> so, you, so if you're talking about apprenticeships, you might hear RTI, and that means related technical instruction. I've heard some states call it RSI, but it's this education component. And that's the piece where um, institutions of higher education um, can be a critical partner for others. So um, there's multiple ways to get involved. You can serve as the RTI provider, the education provider for an existing program, or you can launch your own program as a group sponsor and provide the RTI, the education piece for any of the employers who are participating in your own program. Once you have the... Um, once you have multiple employers, though, you will need to kind of convene, converge, agree on uh, an occupation because apprenticeships are registered by occupation. Each occupation has its own set of competencies 
and things that a person needs to be able to to uh, needs to know and be able to do. <clears throat> so at the end of this apprenticeship program, what are the things that a person should know and be able to do? And are they proficient on all of these competencies? And the things that a person who uh, will eventually become, you know, for example, a CNC precision machinist, and that's a manufacturing occupation, are completely different competencies than a person who's going to be an industrial maintenance mechanic. So you can see how the set of competencies, the set of of proficiencies would differ by occupation. So with your employer partners, you would need to um, agree on what is the first occupation you're going to register. It could be <clears throat> it could be uh, that you have um, multiple employers who are all manufacturers and uh, you can get them to agree on sort of the lowest common denominator and start out with, with something that would serve the needs of multiple employers. And I hope that that kind of answers the question. It could get, I could go on and on, but um, those are the things that you would need to do to, to really get started is to develop the partners who will um, provide each of the pieces of this puzzle. All right. So it's, it's a little complicated. There's so many pieces involved, but you all are willing to walk people through this, right? That's something yes. that you do. Okay. Our so number one job is holding hands. Uh, so we hold your hand the whole time. We walk you through, we say for your very specific state, here are the things that need to happen. Um, what do you have in place so far? What is the occupation? And then we start from there. So yes. Okay. I love that because um, it, it, it does feel complicated and a little overwhelming. So your role as an intermediary is to just help with this whole process, which I love. Um, we can all use more help in life. Really, really lovely thing. Um, okay, so here's another question. Uh, Melissa, this is for you. So what can uh, minority serving institutions and other colleges and universities do to engage employers to participate in registered apprenticeship. So um, how, how does that happen? And uh, also, um, well, I'll start with that. I'll start with that. Um, that's a really good question. And um, employer engagement is kind of the, the number one topic that a lot of institutions and organizations and everyone wants to know. Um, so it isn't um, just minority serving institutions, it's community colleges real large. It is um, workforce boards. Um, everyone wants to know how to engage employers. And I would say that, you know, there's there's lots of things you can do to get in front of employers. Um, you can, you know, uh, go to your chamber of commerce and uh, join uh, different industry groups, um, depending on, on what um, industry is really prevalent in your area. You probably uh, have some industry associations that exist already, and you could just go to a few meetings and um, and uh, you really want to try to put your finger on the pulse of the business community that is surrounding your your institution. Um, uh, there's there's probably multiple industries uh, in your area, and um, you let's not try to boil the ocean in the very first entrance into apprenticeships. We would. We would um, want to kind of dip our toe in and see what is what is the highest need, the low hanging fruit, and try to serve that need first. So, um, so let's say that there's a big manufacturing community or a big healthcare community. Um, you would want to uh, have a conversation with um, people who are who are in that industry. So you could go to an industry association, or you could just get an appointment with one of the. Um, the employers in your area. Now, I really recommend talking to a lot of employers because that's how you're going to recognize trends, and that's how you're going to understand that I've heard this. I've heard this before. This is the third or fourth time I'm hearing this same thing. That you'll you'll get an understanding of what are the the issues with um with employers, and what are the challenges that they're facing in their industry. And you really do want to come to them with an understanding of their industry. Um, people in higher education are experts in higher education. And um, people in business are um, their own experts in, in their own fields. And sometimes we use language that the other party does not understand. There's, there's a wall between um, education and business. Um, <clears throat> if you're in the business community, even if you say something as simple as, 
Um, oh yes, we can have that for you next semester. People have no idea what next semester means. It could mean January 15th. It could mean August 24th. We don't know. It's so, so being very careful about the way that um, you use language when you're talking to, to people in the business community. And um, I would say my highest recommendation is just ask them a ton of questions. Just try to understand their concerns and their needs from their perspective. So if you get an appointment with a, with a business, you want to have them carve out an hour so that you can go to their place of business and take their tour and understand from their perspective. You know, if I put a student in this, in this uh, company, would they be comfortable? Is this a, is this an environment that's good for my students? And so you, so you would get a really good sense of, of their company when you're from, when you're in their place of business and ask them what can, um, what are your workforce needs? What can our college uh, do to be a resource for your workforce needs? And, um, you know, what is your, your um, most difficult position to fill? And, you know, there's a lot of questions that you can ask. I'll also plug um, that uh, JFF has an employer engagement, an equity focused employer engagement field guide uh, that's going to be published next month. And it comes with a um, action planning toolkit and a discovery meeting cheat sheet. So that'll have a huge list of questions that you can ask when you're in your discovery meetings with employers. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, I just want to ask, a, this is a quick question. Uh, how much time does it take to set this up? Meaning like in terms of timeline, like from, from start to like launching your registered apprenticeship. I'm just curious about that. That is a really good question. And um, it can take, um, it can take quite a while. Um, I've heard people say that it can take up to a minimum of seven meetings with a single employer to get them to have their internal buy-in. Mm. Um and I mean, I've had it happen faster than that when uh, when an employer is ready and you have everything all laid out, you've got a group sponsorship, you just need employer partners to participate. You can use this as sort of a, um, you can sort of sell it in a sales, it's a sales job really to um, go out into the employer community and uh, bring in new employers to start a whole program all, you know, from scratch. Um I would say give yourself at least a year because you have to build your partnerships. You have to agree on an occupation. You have to get faculty and industry partners to, to look at work processes that would fit the, that very specific occupation. You um, then you need to write it all up in the, in the proper um, forms that are going to be um, required for that particular state. Um, I've seen it take upwards of four and five months to get through the registration process, particularly if it's, if it's a group sponsorship and there's, um, uh, multiple locations, um, sometimes take a little bit longer. So if you have a national company, uh, with multiple locations, um, it can be, uh, a, a bit of a challenge to figure out who's going to provide the RTI in this location versus this location. It can be done. It just is um, broader partnership building. Um, and um, then there's, so you get through the registration process and then you have to go through sort of what I would call an implementation phase. Um, so just because you have a registered apprenticeship program does not mean that anyone knows that you have an apprenticeship program. Uh, you have to market the program. You have to, uh, you know, put out a press release. You have to figure out what are the processes that you need to put in place so that people can apply for the apprenticeship program. What form do they fill out? Who gets the form? Where does it, where does it land and in whose inbox? How does the, uh, how does the person, the applicant, um, get to the multiple companies who are, who are, um, hiring for that particular role. So, um, there, there's a lot to think about after you register an apprenticeship program in terms of getting it launched off the ground. Um, and again, this is, this is an area where JFF can help and support you in, um, implementing the program. Um, just know that, you know, if, if you build it, they will not come. They have to know that it's there. They have to, <laughs> they have to, 
have a way of applying for the program, interviewing with the companies. And um, if those processes aren't yet in place, then um, it's going to it's going to take a while. So um, we're in uh, November. Um, if you were ready to go right now and you have employer partners and you can get the whole thing registered and also go through sort of a recruiting phase where you're recruiting students and they're applying for it and they're and they're interviewing with the employers, it's possible that you could launch your program in the fall semester or in August of 2024. But, um, you know, there's there's sort of a cycle of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you get that that first group, that first cohort launched off the ground in the next year, you might reserve your fall semester for bringing on new employer partners and your spring semester for the companies who are participating to recruit and then have the summer period for a, um, you know, a hiring deadline and a, um, a signing ceremony of sorts so that uh, apprentices, new, brand new apprentices can start their whole new lives. It's going to, it's going to change their lives because now they're students and they're a new employee of a new company. They have to, you know, there's going to be so many different changes in their lives. And, um, you know, this is a time when, when apprentices really need a lot of support. Um, and, uh, so they would, um, want to imprint, if you will, <laughs> on their employer rather than on the college. So they would have to have some some period of time to work before they start their, their education component. Um, and then uh, it just kind of starts going in a cycle where you're hiring and starting a new cohort. Um, it takes a while to get to that point, and, uh, it, but it can be done. All right, and there's a big payoff, right? For everyone involved, it seems like. I think so. The payoff, of obviously, for, for colleges is that it increases your enrollment and increases your retention because apprentices stay with their uh, stay with their jobs. Um, if you have attrition, it's probably going to happen right away in their first semester or their first, you know, few weeks when they when they realize, oh, all of this is too much or it's um, more than I expected. So, you know, have really good expectation management and um, support for them and in that first semester, because if you can get them past that first that first piece, um, they're they're going to stay. And again, like Ginger said, um, apprentices have a ninety two percent retention rate, so it's um, it's a really it's a really good way to increase retention, um, completion, and uh, increase your enrollment. So. I'll end it there. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. So I have a question for both of you. And that is, can you talk about the resources that JFF has that can make this easier? So tell me all the things. And I know we're going to drop some of those in the chat, but what are the things that JFF does uh, to uh, make setting up registered apprenticeship easier for folks? What do you have? And uh, whoever wants to go first, Melissa or Ginger, whoever wants to go first is fine. Don't fight too hard. Okay. All right. Okay. I was like, who's going to unmute first? <laughs> so yeah. So uh, JFF, um, just generally, um, the Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning have um, three levels of technical assistance that we provide. Um, the first is resources and tools. So we have program design frameworks. We have online courses all about um, everything to do with registered apprenticeship, even one is very specific to the registration process. So how to register uh, a registered apprenticeship. Um, we have a mentorship course for um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in registered apprenticeship. We have a course that um, teaches you how to implement the equal employment opportunity component of registered apprenticeship. So we have resources galore for you as far as registered apprenticeship is concerned. Um, then we also offer group technical assistance and training. So um, we can, that can be either in like series, like um, with small groups of folks and in specific areas, regional or um, all educators or all employers or all support um, organizations. 
Um, and then that also includes our webinars and those are all recorded and also on our site. You can, you can find access to those as well. Um, but then also we offer that individualized TA and that's what um, TA is technical assistance. Um, and that is what Melissa was referring to earlier with we are, we can be there every step of the way to help um, guide someone through the process. And then on top of that, we have a couple of other programs that offer um, incentive funding. So we currently have a youth apprenticeship intermediary um, contract project that has incentive funding available. And we can um, share that as well. That's uh, a youth focus. Um, and the incentive funds can be used for a variety of um, expenses that um, kind of are, are part of the, the launch of an apprenticeship program, except for paying apprentice wages. Um, and I do believe that um, Melissa's project, the uh, Idea M, and I'm not going to try to um, parse out the, the words for that acronym for you, she can do that, um, also has um, incentive funding available as well. All right, all right, Melissa. Yes. Uh, yes to everything Ginger said. There's so many resources available on JFF's website, so many um, frameworks and uh, courses, Canvas courses. You can do them at your own pace. You can do them multiple times if you if you feel like, what did they say? I, <laughs> it's just online um, resources. Um, and um, we do have funding available. Ginger is um, a director for a program called Youth Apprenticeship uh, Intermediary. And so she is um, really more focused, that particular project is more focused on um, youth apprenticeships. And um, my project is more focused, we're an intermediary for manufacturing and agriculture. So we're more occupation specific without any kind of age requirements. Um, and so um, we have incentive funding available to begin your program. Um, we're really interested in um, helping with diversity, equity, and um, accessibility, particularly in manufacturing and agriculture, because um, women and people of color are underrepresented in those um, those occupations. Um, and um, we have... Uh, Again, um, just we're an industry intermediary, so we can help you set up, you know, weekly calls with us to uh, tell us, you know, how it's going and we can kind of nudge you along and <laughs> get you to that process, uh, get you, get you through the process. Um, uh, and I just wanted to, to back up because, um, Ginger mentions one of the courses that we have is a mentorship course. And one of the requirements of an apprenticeship program is that, um, every, every apprentice has to have a mentor on the job. Um, most apprenticeship programs have a one-to-one -one mentorship requirement. There's a ratio. So, um, for every person who is unskilled, there needs to be at least one fully skilled, fully competent journey worker level person, um, which means that they're an expert or that they've completed an apprenticeship program in the past themselves. And um, that person needs to oversee the training and education of the of their apprentice. So, um, you know, sometimes that might be, you know, the best registered nurse or the best teacher or the best, um, you know, maintenance mechanic that ever lived, but they've never, um, supervised anybody, or they've never been a mentor to an apprentice in the past. And we have courses that can help the, those, those folks, um, apprenticeship programs also, uh, if they've been, you know, operating for, for two years or more, and they have five or more apprentices, they're required to have an affirmative action plan. We can help them, um, we can help sites set up their affirmative action plan. Um, <clears throat> we have EEO uh, compliance courses. Um, we have series of webinars, just like Ginger said. <laughs> that, uh, And I think that um, the series of webinars that uh, the Idea M Project puts on is different from the series of webinars from the Youth Apprenticeship. They also have a... Um, uh, community of practice. There's just so many resources available. Um, and, and I'll be honest, there's also a lot of resources available on the apprenticeship.gov website. They've improved it so much over the last several years. 
It's incredible. There are, um, there's a partner finder. There's other tools that you can use, um, like the universal outreach tool. And, um, there's just so many resources. Um, and Mary Beth, if you don't mind, I'll stay with the, this mm -hmm. idea of the outreach tool, because I really want you guys to know that, um, the universal outreach tool is an incredible tool. I think that, um, Natalie's going to drop it in the chat and, um, we'll certainly follow up with that, but it's a, it's basically a map that, um, if you put in your zip code, it'll tell you all the CBOs and FBOs and, and partners that are in your area that, um, you can partner with to, to build and design a program. And, um, the, one of the beautiful things about this is that you can contact your local apprenticeship registration or, and, um, apprenticeship training coordinator, which is going to be um, that uh, Department of Labor site for your state. And you can get on that list so that if other apprenticeship programs or other employers or people in your area are trying to find partners, um, they could they will find your, your institution, your college, if you get on that list. So um, I encourage you to, to play around with the universal outreach tool and um, try to ensure that you're on that list. All right. So we have a bunch of questions in the chat. So I'm going or in the Q and A. So I'm going to move over to, um, to the questions. Thank you all for answering my questions. Uh, here's a, a great question, which is due to the competing costs of flight training and a degree, what are your thoughts on an apprenticeship model for aviation, not mechanics as a career path for students who might want to pursue higher education also? What do you think? So I would say that um, most, um, I don't know if it's a good idea to say most, I would say a lot of um, registered apprenticeship programs use community colleges for their uh, RTI, their related technical instruction. And so it is college. There's not either or college or apprenticeship because when you're doing your apprenticeship, you're earning college credit because the RTI is, is college courses. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's, it's not necessarily at that point a choice. Um, and I would say aviation is a perfect um, high skill job. Uh, I know that there are several um, companies who are, who are already starting an apprenticeship program. I know of one in California, um, Joby, who's, who's doing, um, aviation technicians. I also know that there is, um, a program through, uh, a major airline. Um, and I want to say it's United, but I probably should know for sure before I put the name out there. It's either United or American. Um, they are training pilots because they can't find qualified talent. And that's that's the whole argument. When you can't find qualified talent, hire unqualified talent and train and educate them to be the perfect employee that you were looking for. Yeah, I will I'll jump in here as well because I, I, I agree. I think that um, for pilot training specifically, it's the perfect model because in order to be a commercial airline pilot, someone has to have a certain amount of flight hours under their belt already in order to receive that license. I want to say, I don't quote me if I'm wrong here, but I do believe it's 500 hours of um, uh, flight hours that they have to have under their belt. And so this would be perfect because then it would allow them to earn those hours while they are working with a mentor. Um, actually, I, I I traveled for National Apprenticeship Week, which is this week, and um, I was on a, a flight from where I'm at in Oklahoma City. It was a very short flight down to Dallas, um, and there were probably five pilots on the flight itself. Of course, two of them are flying the airplane, but the others were either sitting in the in the out with the in the main cabin and some were sitting in, in the jump seat. But I was thinking to myself, what a perfect opportunity this would be then to get some of those hours for an up and coming pilot um, under their belt before they actually, you know, are on the job on their own. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK, here's a question. Uh, what are the best apprenticeships to start? 
I would, I would say, you know, listen to your business community, listen to your employer partners and, um, you know, ask them what is the most difficult position you're, you keep having to fill. Um, and, um, if you hear, if you hear the same answer among multiple employers, you can get them all into a room and, and help them to agree on sort of the lowest common denominator of what are the skills that a person that they want to train up in, um, more high, you know, in these higher skills, um, that can, that can move beyond the, the basic, um, the basic skills that they need. So this is going to be very contingent upon, you know, what is the, in, what are the industries in your area and, um, and, uh, you know, what programs, what programs you already have. Um, if you don't have a, um, a clean room at your uh, institution or, you know, a, a lithium battery manufacturing <laughs> um, program and, um, you know, your employers are asking for that. It's going to involve a much deeper partnership to start a whole new program of study. So um, if you already have programs like business, banking and finance, um, uh, healthcare, you know, occupations that you're sort of already serving the business community, um, then you can ask those employer partners, you know, um, would apprenticeship be something that you would be interested in starting? Great. I like that answer. Very good answer. Um, here's another question. Um, how do apprenticeships differ from paid internships? I think that's a great question because I've often had wondered that too. Um, so if you don't mind, Ginger, I'll say, <laughs> um, an internship is time boxed. That's the number one difference. Um, an internship has an end date. So you would hire an intern for a semester or for the summer or for a year, but there's always this, this time box, right? Um, when you hire an apprentice as an employer, uh, you would hire that person with the intention of retaining them indefinitely. You're, you're going to train and educate them. They're going to have this learning component. It's all work-based learning, but, um, the internship is going to end. And at that point, the employer can say, Hey, I really want to hire you, or they can let you go. And also the, the student can say, um, yeah, now I'm going to go, you know, live my life. Thanks for the experience. Or they can say, yes, I, I want to work for you. But, but there's this moment in time when the internship ends and that's where the decision comes in to play, whether or not you're going to employ that person. Um, an apprenticeship is employment. It starts with employment. You get hired. Great answer. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Here's another one. Can you share some details about how much funding um, and for how long is available to employers who participate? I can take that one. Um, so through the local workforce board, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, and through some other um, federal agencies and tribal agencies as well, there is funding available to offset um, up to 50% of um, wages for, um, they call it an OJT within the workforce boards. Um, that's an on-the-job training funding. Um, it goes directly to the employer to pay for about 50%. And that's only for a limited amount of time. So that's, I think, um, through six months, it's been, a, it's been a little while since I've, um, since I've gotten into it. And I believe it's different, um, it in different areas, the, the workforce boards in different states and the workforce office in different states operate a little bit differently, but it's generally, and that is only for those apprentices who qualify. And so you can find those through the local workforce board. That's the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Um, tribal councils, workforce offices also receive um, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds. Um, there is another title within uh, WIOA or uh, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that is... Um, for um, migrant farm workers. I believe that is the ORO grant and that can off also offset. There is from the veterans office as well. Um, and then 
um, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. And so those all have resources for, and that the stipulation is for those who qualify, for those who are eligible to receive those benefits, but they are short term. Like I said, it can, it's only half and it's only up to six months. And so it's a nice way to hook the employers. But one thing that you want to make sure of is that the employers have the ability to sustain the program beyond that. So once those funds have depleted, then they need to be able to support the program and the apprentices beyond that. So that through, through the completion of the program and beyond as they hire them on into, into full-time employees. So I, I always, I like to say that that's the, the resources there, but it's really important that employers don't lean on it so much so that they can't sustain the program. All right. All right. Good answer. Here's a, here's another question. And, um, uh, are all apprenticeships paid because uh, this person said not not all internships are paid, sadly. So are they all paid? And I think I know the answer because it's employment first, right? Okay, so always paid. Yes. Nobody's ever trying to get away with not paying. <laughs> okay. I will, I will say that um, as apprenticeships have grown in popularity over the last, you know, five to, to 10 years, um, a lot of employers have used the word apprenticeship when they don't mean registered apprenticeship, when they actually mean internship. And um, also there was um, a lot of confusion um, in the previous administration uh, where some states um, were trying to set up IRAPs, which was um, industry registered apprenticeship programs. Um, some of the industry registration was even more challenging than just registering your program. And so um, it it didn't really take off. And um, I mean, not, not on a national scale, there might have been some pockets of, of popularity, but overall you would have to find an industry association who was willing to register the program and they had to answer a ton of questions. So um, I think that uh, during this current administration, the um, uh, it, there's only registered apprenticeships, but um, be careful, you know, if you're talking with, uh, you know, for, for people who are, who want to become an apprentice, be careful that you are um, becoming involved in a registered apprenticeship program that um, is definitely always paid. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to try to get these last two questions in before we end. So one of them is, um, is the Department of Labor the best source for more stats about the benefits of apprenticeship? I'm assuming this person's asking to maybe convince their organization to get involved. Um, for example, you shared that approximately 93% of apprentices remain with the employer. So where do you get the best stats if you're trying to make a case for this? I think, yeah, Department of Labor is a, is a good resource, but then also um, there are several intermediary organizations similar to Jobs for the Future. Um, and I know that there has been some publications developed in the last few years from Jobs for the Future and our other partner organizations are surrounding the return on investment for registered apprenticeship. So I think that... Um, there should be plenty of resources out there regarding ROI of registered apprenticeship. That would also be a really great um, resource for those statistics. Great, great. All right, so here is um, the last question I wanted to ask, which was um, basically, uh, let's see, what, what, what are some, and I know you talked a little bit about this, but can you talk a little bit more in depth about what are organizations that can be partners, and um, is there how do you how do you find these right? Is there a tool to do that, or um, just curious about that? Yes, there um, there is a partner finder, um, and um, the partners that you know are critical. So let me just back up. If you're an employer, a company. You can run an apprenticeship program all by yourself without any partners. If you are not an employer, 
then you cannot. Um, you must have partners who will um, take on pieces pieces of this project or this uh, program. So if you're an employer, you can register an, an apprenticeship program as an individual company. You can develop and design a training program and hire a faculty member to teach that training program and then provide the on-the-job learning experiences and the mentor and uh, do, do everything by yourself. Otherwise, you really need to bring partners into this work. Um, and companies honestly really don't want to design their own internal um, training programs. They would love it if there was one that already existed. And your college is probably uh, positioned to do that. Another really good thing that co uh, community colleges can bring to the partnerships um, is recruiting support. So you can help them with recruiting. You can um, vet resumes, you can uh, test students to ensure that they're that they have some type of um, mechanical aptitude or uh, uh, math ability or um, language ability or whatever it is that is a requirement of the job. Um, and um, community colleges can can uh, easily help that help with that. So, um, other partners are WIOA partners, um, wraparound supports. Um, you can partner with uh, CBOs to help with um, things can like- Can you say what a CBO is? Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Community-based organizations or um, faith-based organizations. A lot of those um, types of organizations that you can find on the Universal Outreach Tool um, or the Partner Finder are available Um probably right there in your area. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I want to, I'm going to wrap things up. I want to thank uh, all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, big thanks to, uh, to uh, Melissa and Ginger and Jobs for the Future for being here and telling us how to do this. Um, very grateful to our team at the Center for Minority Serving Institutions. And I did want to tell everyone that we are, we did record this and we are going to send it out to everyone who registered. And we'll also send a whole bunch of resources as well to get you moving forward. And we'll make sure you know how to contact JFF so that they can hold your hand throughout the process. Because I know if I were doing this, I would need a little hand holding too. So thank you so much, everyone. And really, really enjoyed spending time with you today. Take good care. Bye.